Greetings, comrades, and welcome to Eastern Border. Once again, I'm saying hi to you at about 6 a.m. in the morning after I've been working all night long. But that's because I wanted to bring something special to you. I have been wanting to talk about this subject for a long, long time already, as it was one of the last things I had put on my mind before the war started out. It was an episode that I had written a bunch of stuff for before everything broke out and was terrible. And then, well, we switched to that. I just saved this up for a moment. And I saved this up because, again, I'm living through a very special time in my own life. Uh, I hope you all remember from the last episode that I'm getting married on Sunday. And, yeah, I'll, I'll be just straight up uh, here. I'm trying to do this as a bit of a fundraiser since I've spent so much money on the wedding. Not like insane amounts, I suppose, because we're trying to do it small and lean and everything. But it's about $3,500. Maybe more. I don't know. <laughs> a lot of reserves have gone in there. And with everything going on, uh, pff, yeah, I thought I'd be better off maybe just releasing something that is old school and maybe nostalgic. And hey, guys, maybe you like it. So maybe some of you will go and click that the Eastern Border LV website and hit the donate button there or become a patron. Because if there is a time that would be really nice if you'd support me, that would be now. Thank you. Because <laughs> after the wedding, we're also going to Texas. Thanks to our Texan listeners. Wow, those tickets were expensive. It's insane. And thank you to all of you. We'll be there. We'll be also super poor there because, wow. But yeah, uh, I'm just making this a bit of a bit of a nostalgic Soviet history episode because I'd be happy if you would give me some support if you can. If you can't, well then, thank you for listening. It doesn't really hurt anyone. I'm just saying, hey, maybe we have someone listening out there. If If truly, truly, CIA would give me a paycheck for once, that would be great. Uh, and yeah, I can keep saying that because I'm, I've been officially told that uh, if I mention this like ever since the first episode, I mentioned this joke, I, I'm probably never getting that paycheck from them. But, you know, it is what it is. However, this episode is something that needs to be said. It's about Stanislav Petrov. Some of you maybe know who he is because of various articles about him and movies. However, you might be surprised that he's totally unknown in Russia itself, especially in these days. The most recent material, besides everything else that I watched about him, was a year-old documentary from uh, Redakcia, who are foreign agents, by the way, in Russia. And they made this documentary about this person without mentioning anything political or the ongoing war. And I think that's kind of their way to maybe talk to people, in a way, and not get arrested. However, they were in-depth, and it was great. But they also skipped some things. Everyone seems to skip some things. And in the West, Mr. Petrov and the whole story is known... Well, to understand the full story, you would have to go and watch nine or ten various documentaries and like everything about him. I'm going to put it in one place. And secondly, there's a lot to think about that these people who've usually talked about this whole situation, they kind of miss. For example, there are some people who say that he stopped the war by doing nothing, and that's just not true. A lot of things have happened, there's a lot of context, and He's one of the most inspirational stories. For once, I, I'm going to give you a, a happy story, in a way, to talk about here on the show. And I know that I normally stick to depressing stuff, and this is going to be sad as well. But I just hope that, you know, for the people who missed the historical episodes from the old days, well, here you go. We'll be back for the war and everything, and I'm not quitting anything. But I think it's maybe time to talk about someone that should inspire all of us, especially today to become just a bit better human beings. What I'm talking about here, obviously, is the whole Cold War stuff. See, after the entry of the Soviet troops into Afghanistan in 1979, and especially after Ronald Reagan assuming presidency of the United States in 1981, you can say that the 80s began a new round of the Cold War. In the spring of 1982, two United States Navy aircraft carrier groups well, rounded Kamchatka and entered the Sea of Ohotsk, where Soviet submarine bases were located. In November 1982, the law of the state border of the Soviet Union was adopted, which at the legislative level established basically the right and duty of the air defense forces to suppress violations of the airspace of the Soviet Union, including the use of weapons and military equipment, quote, in cases where the termination of the violation or the detention of violators cannot be achieved by other means. At the end of March 1983, three United States Navy aircraft carriers entered the waters of the Aleutian Islands, where they conducted exercises for three weeks. On April 4th, 1983, in the area of Ares-Lesser-Kuril Ridge, 
six A7 attack aircraft entered the airspace of the Soviet Union to a depth of 2 to 30 kilometers and carried out conditional bombing on the territory of Zelyonny Island, making several passes to attack ground targets. Based on the results of the investigation of the incident, by the order of Soviet Minister of Defense Dmitry Ustinov, measures were taken to replace the MiG-21 and MiG-23 fighters based in the Kuril Islands and Sakhalin with the newer MiG-31 fighters to suppress possible provocations. Now, this is just to put in the context things that are going to happen next. Because uh, I want you to picture this. You are sitting in a plane in August 31st. You're flying off from New York to go to Seoul so that you could, I don't know, enjoy some K-pop there. Well, that happened since you're, you're boarding your Boeing 747-230B. The board number is HL7442. The scheduled flight is KE007. It's a New York Seal route with stop in Anchorage, just like I mentioned, to refuel everything. On September 1st at 1 p.m., the liner took off from Anchorage and headed for Seoul, with 23 crew members and 246 passengers on board. There, well, there was a problem there, because this route the projected route that would take take you from Anchorage to Seoul, well, that's the one that led the closest to the Soviet territory. Almost from the very beginning of the flight, the airliner deviated straight up from the course, which was aimed directly at the Bethel radio beacon and further along the R-20 route. Instead, it passed 20 kilometers north of the lighthouse. But what really struck and what caused the whole tragedy there was that... Uh, at the same time, an American reconnaissance aircraft, Boeing RC-135, of the Air Force, of course, was out there. And that also approached Flight 007 at the same time. The radar observation data later presented by the Soviet side showed that Flight KE-007, at a certain point in time, approached RC-135 so much that marks on radar screens merged. After this one plane, presumably an airliner, headed deep into the territory of the Soviet Union, and the other took a route close to the international air route. So, well, at that point, there was a situation where people were confused. A lot of Soviet people took to meaning that this whole flight that flew over the Soviet Union was this Flight 007, that it was an American reconnaissance aircraft, not, you know, this pipeline. There were military facilities in these areas as well, which made it all the worse. This Boeing flew over for flights were totally prohibited. The, the aircraft was flying over Kamchatka uh, and, and Sakhalin and everything. Uh, the, the, those places in the, in the Pacific Ocean where the bases were at. And again, tons of tragedy, but you look better. Approaching Kamchatka, Su 15 TM fighters of the 865th Fighter Aviation Regiment were scrambled from the Yuzelov airfield to intercept it. Flight 007 then left Soviet airspace, continuing its flight over the Sea of Okhotsk, and fires returned to base. When flying over the NIPPA control point at uh, 1708 GMT, the plane again deviated from course by 300 kilometers, heading towards Sakhalin. When the Boeing 747 was detected by the radar, the duty forces at the Smichin and Sokoy airfields were put on high alert. In 1742, when the airliner routed Cape Sirpigny, a MiG-23 ML fighter from the duty flight of this whole regiment was scrambled to intercept. And, well, another fighter plane, Su-15, also was sent there to intercept the whole thing. At 1802, flight KE-007 re-entered Soviet airspace over Sakhalin. The maximum deviation from the usual route reached 500 kilometers. The Su-15 interceptor fighter caught up with the intruder and accompanied him studying this whole situation. Being out of sight of the airline's pilots, he fired several long warning bursts from an air cannon. And, yeah, you know, this is so researched that even it specified that 243 rounds were expended. In his memoirs, the first class pilot of this interceptor, Lieutenant Colonel of the USSR Air Force, Gennady Nikolaevich Opsipovich, knows that the warning shots were fired with armor piercing rather than tracer shells, because they simply weren't there, were loaded, and the pilots of the airliner might not have noticed them. 
he also did not try to contact the plane by radio. This required switching to another frequency. The pilot admitted that he could not identify the intruder aircraft. Quote, we do not study civilian aircraft of foreign companies. End quote. However, Osipovich is confident that his presence did not go unnoticed. The intruder aircraft reduced its speed to 400 kilometers per hour, which the Swift pilot took as an attempt to avoid interception. A further reduction in speed would have resulted in the interceptor falling into a tailspin. Well, he reported back that they had ignored his shots. The intruder's movement was above the lower range of the clouds. At 1824, an order was received from the ground to destroy the intruder. And Osipovich fired two missiles at the target from a distance of five kilometers. The first missile flew past, the second exploded near tail, damaging the control systems. Initially, after the whole collision, the aircraft began to climb, but then, well, obviously fell down, entered a spiral, and, well, hit down into the La Perouse Strait near the Tatar Strait and was completely destroyed upon impact. All 269 people on board were killed. Out of these people, 40 were American citizens. One of them was a senator of the United States. Reagan at the time stated that uh, American intelligence knew that this was a result of a mistake and not an intentional assassination. However, Reagan called this incident a crime against humanity that should never be forgotten, an act of barbarity and inhuman cruelty. Reagan also stated that once development is completed, a GPS navigation system which they had been using for the military, will be freely available for civilian applications, which would help the whole process. But at the same time, obviously, this was insane. A lot of people don't even know about this tragedy, and among others, but this happened there in September. Now, like I said, 40 American citizens dead, and <laughs> American senator. This was a massive aggravation of everything. And this is the proper context of what happens next. Because we're talking, we're not leaving that September, that very September when this is happening. There were protests uh, all over the place in the United States after the plane crash. And on the other side, if it wouldn't be this September or this crash, maybe things would have gone a bit otherwise. But they didn't. And I think now is the time when I introduce you to Stanislav Yevgafrovich Pietrov. He was born on September the 7th, 1939, in Vladivostok. He passed away in May 19, 2017, near Moscow. He was a lieutenant colonel, a graduate of the Kiev Higher Engineering Radio School, an engineer analyst. As half of my listeners are military people, another half are IT people, broadly speaking, this person can be related to, to both of you. He was one of those people who was coming from a civilian background but served in the army. He was out there basically programming the OCO satellite system, or the I, which was the Soviet system for detecting launches of ICBMs from continental United States. It was part of the space echelon of the missile attack warning system. The thing is, he was a person who wasn't even supposed to be there. He, in his childhood, you know, his sport was boxing, and he got into the wrong crowd. Although he wanted to be a scientist at all times, apparently his mother... Uh, sent him into the path of his dad. They moved around a lot because of his army career, and he just went to the cadet school. And then, of course, he entered this engineering university as a civilian, and then after already finishing this stuff, he he joined up and became an officer at the Soviet you know, Red Army. And the thing is, again, he when we talk about him, we have to remember that he was not a soldier. He had a civilian education. He did not go through the rising ranks of the army. You know, he, well, went to the cadet school, military education for his high school, and then he went to a civilian facility in Kiev. And if you listen to my, I don't know, if, this was like a couple of years ago, but still, the whole computer episode. You don't remember that in Soviet Union, Ukraine was the part where all the whole research happened, everything. So he was there and studying with the whole Soviet cybernetics approach. He was programming the whole system. But all the officers there, they had to have uh, so-called combat shifts. Like a couple of times per month just to, you know, see how they functioned in total, how how their work impacted lives and, you know, to, to be there and, and just not say it's behind, behind a computer. He was a very successful person as well, but introverted and everything, and he was at the command post. He was the chief guy there. And the thing is, he also had a wife, and they lived in a very close 
close town, one of those secret cities. He was always living kind of pretty well in Sovietar. But you see, on the night of September 26th, 25 days after this airplane crash, Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov was on the operational duty and he was at the command post of the Space Missile Launch Detection System at Serpukhov 15. That's 100 kilometers from Moscow and Serpukhov 15 is the name, again, of this hidden town, hidden city that all the people live there, you know. Those places where you couldn't even talk to your wives about what you've done in the work and much less even tell anyone where you live if you moved outside that era. The command post was there to receive all the warnings, the first warning system. Here, I want to go back a bit and talk about the technical stuff. I want to talk about the OCO satellite system there. This thing operated until 2019 and it was started in 1982. It was super new at the time. Soviet Union was lagging behind the American, the United States system. Therefore, it wasn't programmed as well or, or bugless at all. It was just, you know, itak sajot, just go and, and try to build this stuff up. It was just something that they built and they tried to work out something that would work like this dead man's switch, you know, the dead man's hand that you probably have seen in the movie, the Kubrick's movie, How I Learned to Love the Bomb. I forgot the total. Dr. Strangelove, there, there we go. Yes, uh, have you seen the movie Dr. Strangelove? The whole creation system was out there and, and people worked and there were like seven satellites there. It was just put on combat duty and they really were trying to work how everything happened and it was like visual satellite data and everything. Local programmers were super happy about the situation but the fact that Soviets also now had a computerized detection system, they really believed in the, the metal more than they believed in, in the man, which was crucial in this case. Another thing that Soviets did at this time was how they actually built stuff and how they prepared for everything. I'm pretty sure most of you have seen the series Chernobyl. I have read all the security materials there. But you have to understand it again, put into context, which most other people were, were talking about this whole mess will probably not tell you, is that the Soviets disregarded the impossible, as they called it. They didn't have safety precautions against everything. They only treated the reasonable dangers, the thing that could actually happen. The problem is those things that can happen like 0.01% of the time can happen at all, and they do, and, well, <laughs> this will be one of these cases. However, the whole meaning was, the idea behind is rational. You see, Soviets stated that if you do not train and do not over-insure yourself and only keep to the realistic, as they thought, dangers and risks, then you don't have to put so many uh, many contingencies in there, then the memorization of the security plans is easier. Basically, if you focus on the realistic risks, then you can just cut down on training time, and the people who will be there, they can be trained better. You, know, you cut down on the amount of risks, you train people to be just really, really good at all the common day risks. But again, the problem is that the really big risks actually happen. Their doctrine was, was different. Petrov is on duty on September 26th. He's basically not even supposed to be there. He's, he's standing in for uh, another officer that had called in sick. And like I said, he's a programmer that's supposed to be there once per month. Well, once or twice, he's just living there and trying to fix the systems. Moved there, by the way, and started working here because he was super happy that he gets to work with something related to space. Sure, he was a party member, but uh, we know from his kids his son, and everyone else, that he totally was not a fan of the Soviet system. He knew that, you know, he was, a, of course, a patriot of his country. However, he was not a fan of the higher-ups, and he knew that, like, at that point, then this is Andropov's era, the whole stagnation of Brezhnev and, and this period had proved to him that the Soviets do a lot of things wrong, that he has to, you know, not agree with everything. Economical situation for him was really good, because he was, like, under um, special care, as many of these higher military officers, but he saw how the rest of the country lived. Everything that was a deficit was good for him and, and it was fully supplied, but most people lacked a lot of their basic everyday needs. So he's sitting there and he's noticing a missile. He's noticing a missile uh, just out there plopping on a screen. And a lot of people misrepresent this because he spots a missile, one, at start. Then he's getting stunned because there's a massive start launch warning signal all over the place. 
and then four more missiles. It seems that the United States had launched a surprise attack at the Soviet Union. It's a bit crazy, but uh, yeah, he's sitting there. And as he said, well, at one point, I really almost shut my pants and I got totally panicky. And then, then he again claimed in a documentary that he had gathered himself and started to talk because he was like the chief person of, of this whole detection unit. And what he's responsible for, what he's responsible for here is that if he makes the wrong decision, then a nuclear war will start. Everything is going to blow up and we will totally see catastrophic results and damage everywhere. Recently, by the way, uh, Soviet Union had tested their Tsar bomb as well. So this is the peak of the Cold War. It's September. Everything's weird because this whole airplane situation happened. Hello there, and thanks for listening to another episode of The Eastern Border. Dear Patreons, thank you more than ever for supporting our show. Your donations are crucial to keep us going, and right now all of your money is going to securing good information for you and to fund Kristov's actual real-life mission to Ukraine to report to you live about the war that is going on there. Also, we would like to use this opportunity to urge you to donate to other organizations that are helping people escape Ukraine safely and to defend the country for those who decide to stay on the ground. One such organization we would like to highlight is the Defending Ukraine Together Come Back Alive movement. Launched in 2014, the Come Back Alive became the biggest organization providing support to the armed forces of Ukraine. You can donate directly from their webpage, comebackalive.in.ua. Remember that no donation is too small. In this situation, every dollar matters, every cent matters. If you're uncomfortable with giving money to war, they do have a position on their website that they are providing Ukrainian army with laptops, lights, photo equipment, cables, and is not purely military. Perhaps that might change your mind, but remember you can also donate to strictly humanitarian organizations such as the Red Cross and others that are helping people escape Ukraine safely. Please also keep following us on social media for all of your latest updates on Eastern Border on places like Twitter and Facebook. Keep listening, keep yourself informed. That's all from me now. See you online. And he sees five, five missiles. The flight time at that point was 30 minutes from the United States to the Soviet Union. And he's risking on the fact that, well, he could destroy the whole world, but if he doesn't, then a half of the Soviet Union will be just destroyed and crushed, and they, we might not even get a strike back there. And I say we because, hey, I was still born in the USSR. He's sitting there being worried about this whole stuff and, and just not knowing what to do. He did not trust the date. He did not trust the computer. He waits until the secondary systems are coming in, until the computer works through the date, because the, obviously the machine is much slower than what we have today. And it comes back and it confirms every missile of the five. It's all correct, the computer says. They have everything, all the data points, everything just shows us, yes, the Americans have launched all these intercontinental ballistic missiles. Except there's one little problem there. The only data point that's not like 100% agreeable to this is that there's no visual confirmation at all. No one has, no one has seen the launch. By the time that he's waited, uh, 12 minutes already have passed. He has 18 minutes left. And there, you know, everyone around him is panicking and screaming and he's sitting there and he has to make a decision because he's the person who is responsible to make a call to his higher-ups, which then triggers a whole lot of issues and everything. And then, you know, Andropov would have just opened the nuclear suitcase and put it all the country on, you know. It's like a lot of people say that he would probably launch nukes instantly. It probably wouldn't be so. Andropov would have just uh, opened up the suitcase and put everything, uh, like all the missile forces, at the combat situation, you know, re ready for launch. And, this, and the United States would have done the same, and the world would be on fire nonetheless. And this guy, you know, he's sitting there, and he's looking at his screen, and he sees five missiles just flying over. But he waits waits for the ground stations, for everything to, to confirm this. This is the point where many people who, who tell this story, who speak about this, probably think that, you know, he did nothing. No, he did a lot about it. 
a lot about this, this situation. He kept his cool. The fact that he wasn't a purely military man, that he was a civilian, who wasn't a huge fan of the Soviet Union, also helped. He knew that not to obey orders directly and everything. And he knew how to, again, keep his cool. When 18 minutes are remaining, after all the computer data is there, he, he basically remembers, and I think, well, I think it's a bit over-exaggerated, but at least in his memoirs and everything, he says that if the United States actually had wanted to do an attack, because he knew what was going on there, he knew that both Soviet and this, uh, the American launch systems were so complex, and they still are to this day, that uh, it would be impossible for some sort of, quote, maniac, end quote, to launch the whole thing. And if the United States would have launched actually a preventive attack, one that would totally be aimed at destroying the Soviet Union in general, then it wouldn't be like five missiles. It would be hundreds, thousands. Now, of course, this is debatable because, you know, there is always the first strike, which with a few missiles to check stuff, and then the other blast would follow. However, he calls his superiors. And he says that this is a fake. That the, that the whole system has been given some sort of weird results. He does not start a nuclear war, and then he lives through the 18 minutes, uh, worst 18 minutes of his life. He could have given the whole order thing. He could have done a lot of other dangerous things. He could have basically started a nuclear war, and he did not. And then the situation, you know, you have to remember that this is a massively, massively peaked up, like, heightened moment of tensions. Because again, in September, this is the same September when the, their plane was struck down. And everyone firmly believes in the Soviet Union, and I think in the United States as well, that although we won't start a nuclear war, they totally will. That's all over the propaganda and the media and everywhere. People legitimately believed that the, like, the Americans would start this whole thing. And if he does not respond, then there is no possible way for a second strike. Tons of people will die. And he didn't. The fact that this is often presented as, as if he did nothing, I, I don't get it. I simply don't get it because he did a lot. He kept his cool and followed his training. Now, just after this situation, he got some praise from his commanding officers who arrived to greet him. But soon, very soon, a few days later on, you know, he was expecting maybe to get some recognition from the Soviet military and everything. But they found out that, uh, yeah, as he was a programmer and one of the authors of the whole system, yeah, they could just blame him for all this situation. They were even like, because of the fact that uh, this started as he hadn't manually filled up his journal as the commands are supposed to go. But as he said, as he was holding Poe in one hand and, and monitoring the situation in the other one, he, he, it was physically impossible for him to fill up his duty journal at the time at all. And because of this small bureaucratic thing that he did not document everything at the given time, they blamed a lot of this. They blamed even the, the whole glitch in the system. Uh, we don't even exactly know what it was. Uh, approximately, the, this whole thing was uh, sunlight reflected off clouds, which then reflected off of Soviet satellites. It's a mess, because obviously the technology is way old at the point. You can't really know what, what happened for sure. And the problem there is that instead of being rewarded, he's being sent into retirement. You couldn't like throw him out completely. However, well, they blamed a lot of the peoples who developed this whole situation and everything. Mimel Petrov himself writes in his memoirs the following, quote, The chief of the staff of the army, General Zavalli, gave a verbal order to remove all developments, recent developments from service. The developers, and we were all civilians, categorically refused to carry out the general's order and left the site. Then the military removed these developments with their own hands. I think this incident was directly related to what happened here in September. As a result of the investigation, we brought to light a whole bunch of shortcomings in the space warning system for the launch of ballistic missiles. The main problems were the combat program and the imperfection of spacecraft. And this was the basis of the whole system. All these shortcomings were eliminated only by 1985, when the system was finally put on combat duty. So there he was. After being sent to retirement early, he was ignored, made a pariah. He was forced to retire, never receiving another promotion. And never recognized inside Russia itself. Later on, various directors and, and, and authors would notice him, and he got his award from the United Nations for preventing a nuclear war, and he also managed to meet Kevin Costner and 
other Hollywood actors like Matt Damon, who whom he was a fan of, because they were making the movie related to this whole Soviet incidents thing, and because of some German people who really wanted to meet him in person, a small business owner who ran um, a funeral company, no less, he managed to visit both the United States and got an interest of a young documentary maker who then later on made this made this movie that you might have seen. It's called The Man Who Saved the Planet. However, he was an introverted man, an introverted person who had terrible issues with communicating everything, and he was basically forced to do some scenes. It's a dark drama, which is weird, but I would highly recommend if you try to watch it, understand that when, when the older person, uh, older Petrov is played by Petrov himself, they really had to work hard with him. He never said that he was a hero. He just stated that he was at the right place at the right time. He was living in his Khrushchevka in not, not so great conditions that you could envy him in any way or form. But he was there. And I'm really happy that he got the recognition he deserved. Because, you know, if you think about it, everyone who was born after 1983, yeah, we have to say thank you to this guy. Now, the big issue is, once again, that in today's situation, his actions, well, still, they're still called meaning. They're not meaningless, but it is weird that at the same time, the Soviet Union just could just blame everything on him. And that we forget, and that we forget that we have heroes like these. In modern Russia, he's not considered a hero at all because, well, right now, it's not about peace. It's not about, it's not about this whole situation where you could live and, and where Soviets had ideals of, of some sort of peace and prosperity. No, no, no. It's changed. It all changed in a moment where at one point during uh, the 8th of, sorry, the 9th of May, when Russians and, and Soviet Union held their victory day, you know, the slogan there changed from the most important thing is that there would be no war to we can repeat this. Repeating all this is a thing that's totally not necessary to anyone. Stanislav Petrov, he really was a hero, and he kept cool, and he did everything he could. And then he was mistreated, made into a pariah, made, made forced to retire, and only in the very latest years of his life, like last five or six, he got recognition in the West. He saw the country, as his son stated in an interview, he saw the country that he was taught to hate, and the country itself enjoyed him, loved him, responded to him. The, the part is that there had also been mistakes, and not to, not to portray that the Soviet technology was worse, Americans also had their own issues. The United States uh, detection system, similar to that one, had also misfired. But the situations were totally different, because it had misfired and said that the Soviets had launched missiles towards America during the time when Khrushchev was in New York himself. I mean, you gotta admit, it's quite different to find and stop the launch and, and, and find bugs when, you know, the Soviet leader is in New York, rather than you're doing the same thing on the Soviet base after just not even a month after the incident with the plane. It's all a miracle that we are here. And it's a, it's a weird story. Again, as his family has stated, he never wanted to be recognized, but he was extremely happy to meet the Hollywood stars and everything. He got used to this whole role that he was given, and he was extremely happy that he got some financial benefits out of it as well, because the pension, well, really wasn't well, especially since after the 1990s, yeah, he, he wasn't paid at all, because the whole pension system fell down in Russia because of the inflation, and, well, everything in the 90s were a pretty horrible time to be alive on. And this, this man, I think, that, that lived and that saved us all, he should inspire you. He's, he's inspired Putin, because right now Russia has heroes who are super violent, and they say how they hate everyone, and everyone hates them, but they don't talk about Stanislav Petrov, the guy who loved peace, the guy who was a bit rebellious, and who saved the world. He's not very well known. There's insane Cold War studies going on all over the place. There's a lot, of, a lot that we still don't know, but I hope that this is the story that you guys will remember. In these days, these dark times, and there's terrorism and war all over the place, we need someone like Stanislav Petrov. We just need the war to stop. And Putin needs to go.
there is no other solution. And I'll be back covering this. But really, before the wedding, I wanted to make this episode where I talk to you about something positive, something inspirational. And I really hope you enjoyed this. Stanislav Petrov, Vyacheslav Pamich, and Tsarstvo Nebesne. And to all of you, do svidanya, tovarish. As always, remember, happiness is mandatory. Thank you for listening to the Eastern Border Show. If you have any questions or comments, go to our website, theeasternborder.lv, and leave a comment there. Or email us at theeasternborder at gmail.com. We'll be sure to answer. You can also follow us on social media and contact us there. If you enjoyed this episode, then leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about us. It really helps us grow the show. And remember, happiness is mandatory.